better get this uh, mute switch on um, so you can hear me this morning. Uh, probably don't care about this, but I was watching uh, a ball game, and uh, they one of the companies was doing how their cell phone service was better than the other, and uh, the guy that was touting it used to be for another company. Can you hear me now, guy? <laughs> I thought, I've seen that guy before. And maybe that would be something, uh, uh, can you hear me now for what we want to talk about this morning? Um, some statements that I've collected over the years on prayer that I think are good. They, uh, I hope they help you. And, um, you know, one of them is very simple, and yet I think we miss the simple many times. Prayer is talking to God. And I think sometimes we just try to make it way more complex than it should be. Prayer is just simply talking to God. Uh, the one I came across just recently uh, that I shared, I think, with Wednesday night group is prayer is helplessness. And uh, I thought about that quite a bit, and I believe that's uh, probably a prerequisite to a good prayer life is realizing we're helpless. And probably I could ask every person in this room this morning and you could tell me about a situation you currently have or have faced where you felt helpless. And that's when prayer really works. Also, uh, uh, Frank, what's that guy's last name? He was a missionary that they said he taught millions of people to read. Uh, Lobber, I believe was his last name. And, and he said, prayer is the mightiest force in all the world. He's got a book. It's an old book now. But his, his thesis, his point of the book is if we could just get all Christian people praying, we would have the mightiest force in all the world. And I thought, well, why didn't I think about that? Uh, it, so it's something for us to think about. My last one is a favorite, Corey Ten Boom. If you don't know who Corey Ten Boom is, you need to Google her and find out great uh, lady that went through the concentration camps of World War II and lost her father, her sister, and uh, trying to help the Jews be safe from the uh, Nazis. Is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? And I think we kind of identify with that, although we don't change tires like we used to. <laughs> uh, tires last longer, but I thought that was a great illustration. I guess this morning what I want to challenge you is with this. I really believe that your prayer life is a, an expression or a measure of your relationship with God. I don't know what your prayer life is. That's between you and God. I think we ought to all have a prayer life. Uh, I'm moved by stories of prayer. And this morning I could spend the time just telling stories that I've either read or heard or experienced of of prayer, answered prayer. Um, but uh, we'll want to look at a, an Old Testament story that I think is going to be interesting to you in just a little bit. But I, uh, I really do want us to think about that your prayer life is an expression of your relationship with God. And therefore, we ought to be wanting to improve it all the time. Got to thinking a little bit about places that I've prayed. Now, when I say that, I mean I've prayed publicly, okay? Because we've all been in places all over the, everywhere where we've probably prayed. But uh, I just was thinking about that. I remember praying at Southeast Polk back when you could. <laughs> I, you, you still can. Of course, you can pray silently, and maybe they do. I think the FCA group meets and you know how things have been going in this country and stuff. And I thought about it. It was a baccalaureate service back when they did that. And it was in the old gym and all that kind of thing. And I thought, wow, times have changed. Uh, here's a place I've prayed that I think few people could say they have ever prayed publicly. And this was in a small group, the Valair Ballroom. <laughs> now, some people probably should have prayed. 
with what's going on when they went there, but that's beside the point. But it was an FCA banquet. I was part of the uh, uh, board in those days and actually prayed with one of the assistant coaches. I think her name's Jan Jensen at the University of Iowa, was it Drake, and that kind of thing. And that was just kind of a, that was a that's always a great time with those uh, kinds of things. I thought, wow, that's pretty, pretty amazing. And... Um, I've been able to pray at the uh, House of Representatives and the, the Senate uh, due to getting invited by people that knew of me. And and I, I just tell you that, just kind of trying to set the tone, not to brag about what I've gotten a chance to do. I've prayed in various hospitals. I've prayed in lots of cemeteries. I remember prayers around the table, both as I was growing up and, and today and raising our kids and all that kind of thing. One of my favorite places to pray is to go on a walk and pray while you're walking. And there's all kinds of venues that you can have for your prayer life. And I hope you've got some of those. But uh, uh, again, uh, it's a powerful, mighty force. And again, I want you to see your prayer life this way, that you're just sitting down across the table from somebody that's either related to you or is a best friend, and you're going to have a conversation. That setting of somebody you really love, care for, know, you're going to have that conversation that probably will go on for quite a while. Like one of my uh, friends was telling about somebody who had a three-hour lunch with somebody that they hadn't seen for a long time, and we've all done something similar to that. That's how we ought to see our prayer lives, our relationship with God, our sitting down across the table with God, And I hope that um, you can have that kind of thing. Now, concerns that we have uh, today, uh, shootings, things to pray about. Uh, shootings in our culture, race relations, terrorism, bathroom issues. I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, who can go in what bathroom now? I never thought we'd be dealing with that one, but we do. Maybe you don't care. Just get in there and get out, I guess is the point anymore. Uh, growing hostility towards Christians, the election, the Supreme Court appointees. You could go on and on and on, and you've got your list of concerns. So uh, this morning, the story that I have selected, I think will help us because it shows itself in a very desperate time in the history of God's people. And so if you want to dig out your Bible and go back deeply into it to 2 Chronicles chapter 1 verses 1 through 30 this morning, we'll tell the story. We'll read bits of it, but I'll largely tell you the story because it has a great lesson and message for us here today. You're going to meet this morning in this section of scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 beginning with verse 1, is Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is an Old Testament king, a king of Judah. There were kings of Judah and Israel because the tribes had divided up. So there were two in Judah and ten in Israel. And, uh, but he's, and most, uh, most all of them were bad in Israel, and a bunch of them were bad in Judah. Jehoshaphat will be a pretty good king. Now, he'll have his foibles, he'll make some mistakes, but by and large, he steps up to the plate, as we would say it today, to be God's prophet, uh, God's king in this case, and do some pretty amazing things, some of which I think you and I can be benefited from if we'll follow his example. So if you found that today, and maybe it's a piece of cake for you, Second Chronicles chapter 20 uh, beginning with verse 1, we're going to see that there's these three nations that were ready to make war with Jehoshaphat. That's verse 1. And one guy came along and said this to him. This is verse 2. A vast army is coming against you from Edom from the other side of the sea. So things are getting hot pretty quickly. Look at verse 3. Alarmed. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Now, what's that indicate? Anytime they fasted, it's serious stuff. This was serious. We have three nations coming against Jehoshaphat and his people. 
And so I want you to, if you underline in your Bible, verse 3 would be a great place because he resolves to inquire of the Lord. That is the first thing that he wants to do and then proclaims the fast. And then verse 4, the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. To seek the Lord. Now, that's a phrase you need to catalog and think about because we need to seek the Lord. And that will be something that we'll expand upon just in a little bit here. So that's what's taking place here. That's the problem in verses 1 through 5. And then we got one more verse here to cover before I tell you something else, and then we'll go into the prayer, which is very instructive. Verse 5 says, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new court courtyard. It's significant because Jewish worship was, of course, going to the temple. And so they gathered there and... Uh, then you were going to read the prayer that Jehoshaphat offered. So what's that mean for you and me? Well, it means several things. You may have a medical diagnosis. It could be cancer. It could be any number of things. And you've just received that from your doctor. You're in the same place that Jehoshaphat was. You might have a child that's in trouble with the law. You might have just lost your job. What are you going to do? You see, will we respond like Jehoshaphat when things get pretty difficult in our lives? And what we see here in this prayer that we're going to see is a king who is willing to lead his people and to begin it by praying. So I want to challenge you that whatever you face, be it the mundane or whether it be something very serious, the first thing we want to do is turn to God in prayer because he still is our only hope for what we're dealing with. We live in a world that seems to want to solve all of its own problems and yet, folks, we know we can't solve our own problems. So I think you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about here in, in this prayer here, which follows in verses 6 through 12. So I hope you'll pay attention to uh, what he says here because it is really meaningful. So he stood up there in the temple, and here's what he said beginning in verse 6. O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? He's asking a question there. You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Catch that phrase. <laughs> Abraham, that's what God said of Abraham. He was his friend. They have lived in it and have built it up a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, those are three pretty heady things, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and will save us. And we'll uh, go further here in verse 10. But now here are the men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came up out of Egypt. I hope you catch that. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. He's just basically saying, God, the, our, our ancestors followed your instructions, and we didn't take these people on, and now this vast army's after us. It's interesting how he reminds him of that. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave as an inheritance. Oh, our God. 
Will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. There's a verse to underline. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. What better statement could we put on a plaque or on the refrigerator door than that statement right there? So this prayer to me, when I read it, was not only instructive, but inspiring. Here is the king. He's in charge, and he's leading the people in prayer. Oh, God, give us somebody in this world that would lead the people in prayer rather than doing something stupid like we have going on in our world today. People who would say, God, I need help. Well, that's what Jehoshaphat did. So let's just break it down just a little bit here this morning. First of all, in that prayer, verses 6 to 12, the first thing he talks about is God's sovereignty or rule or control. God's in control. That's the point. And he says, you rule in heaven, you rule kingdoms, you rule nations. And he says, all the power and might is in your hand. You see, it's a statement about the character of God. Your prayer life is in direct proportion to your understanding of what God is, who he is, and how he acts. Understanding the nature of God will make your prayer life soar. But when we don't understand God then we come across with all these weird ideas, like some people, a deist says, yeah, God created, but he walked away from it. No, that's not what Scripture says. God created, and he's still actively involved. In fact, you know what that's called? That's called providence, the providence of God. That means God's at work in history. And if you don't know that, you need a little reading. Because God has been in work, at work in history, and God will continue to be at work in history. That's his nature. This is his creation. We are his children. And we get a chance to talk to the one who holds this thing all together. Do we get the magnitude of that? I hope you do. What a privilege to be able to have a conversation with the creator of the universe. We can So he talks about God's control. He talks about God's covenant. Remember, he said, you drove the people out so we could occupy this land. And uh, there was a covenant between Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. My goodness, when you mention those names, the Jews' ears would, would stand up. You're talking about the big names of Judaism. Yeah, that's who God worked through. And you see, when you came to Christ, you made a covenant, you made an agreement. You confessed your faith in Jesus Christ. You sealed that in the act of Christian baptism. You were promised forgiveness of sin. You were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, The presence of Jesus lives in the life of the believer. And uh, you have all of that. And you follow Jesus as best you can because you made an agreement, a covenant with him. God's presence in verses 8 and 9, and that's huge because so many people don't believe they can sense the presence of God. I pray almost daily with patients in the hospital, and one of my phrases is, may they, may they feel your presence. May they feel your presence. I don't know about you, but if I'm laying on a gurney going into surgery, that's the, first, that's the main thing I would want to feel is the presence of God. Now, I hope the doctor's good, but the presence of God is still more important. That's what he's talking about here. And I really believe that our, our prayers are deepened when we understand that. And um, he says that, that uh, again, Jehoshaphat says, you will, you will hear us and you will save us. And you see, our prayers go somewhere when we have confidence in God. And the Old Testament, uh, again, this Old Testament king was appealing to God. I heard uh, the, uh, if you've done any reading in history, Stephen Ambrose ought to be 
uh, uh, somebody you read. Uh, he's written a lot of American history stuff. Uh, he's gone now. But I heard this on uh, a YouTube thing a friend of mine sent me. He's talking about President Eisenhower. And Ambrose wrote a lot on Eisenhower. Spent a lot of time with him before he died. He said, you can take this for what it's worth, but I think he knows what he's talking about. Eisenhower began every cabinet meeting with prayer. Now, there may be others that have done that. We don't know about it. That's some of the stuff that's not written in the books. But I'm just saying that uh, that might explain why we had some good years. <laughs> and I know that's ancient history, and some of you have never experienced it. God's goodness, verse 10. Oh, this prayer talks about God. He said, he said, you did not allow us to attack these people when we came out of Egypt. And now they're coming after us. And you know what? He's explaining the goodness of God. God spared those folks. Now they're amassing an army to attack us. I tell you what, we get into trouble when we start doubting the goodness of God. A characteristic of God is goodness, folks. And yes, you may doubt it at times, but the goodness of God is a quality we never want to let go of. And then he talks about in verse 11 being God's possession. That these folks of Israel here have received an inheritance and they've been living and now these folks are trying to attack us. Uh, a friend of mine brought this to my attention recently that uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians that Paul writes to a fouled up church, the first chapter and then the second uh, letter, the ninth chapter, and there's probably other places, uses the phrase, you are enriched in Christ or you are made rich in Christ is a good translation. Yeah, you're wealthy, folks, if you're a Christian. Now, not financially, but a, fi a, a wealth that far exceeds finances. We are rich in Christ. And so he's talking about this idea of being enriched in God in the Old Testament situation. So it's just fascinating to look at this prayer. And I hope you'll go home sometime and sit down and read this prayer and just think about this is both instructive as to how we ought to pray, but it's also inspirational that an Old Testament king at a time of great disparity would pray to God in this way. Now, verses 13 through 21, it gets the plot thickens here because we meet this other guy that is a Levite. Yes, look at verse 13. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. I mean, we said it was a fast. It was a calling of everybody to prayer. And it says, men, women, and children. And then the spirit, in verse 14, of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, and the son of the son of, and we'll drop a couple of these off, a Levite. And he stood in the assembly, and he spoke up. After they prayed to God, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. Remember, it's just waiting to attack, for the battle is not yours, but God. Now, there's a phrase to hang your hat on. The battle is the Lord's, not ours. Tomorrow, march down against them, and they'll be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jerul, and you will not have to fight the battle. Now, that had to be a shocker. Most of them probably thought we're going to die. No, you're not going to have to fight the battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance of the Lord that he will give you. Ah, you ever hear that phrase before? That's what Moses said before they crossed the Red Sea. Stand up and see the deliverance of the Lord. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Which is also, I think, what David said as he faced Goliath. Do you see how they call upon their history? Do you see how they call upon the characters, their 
spiritual ancestors to inspire them. And so he says simply that, the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. Folks, we've got to, we've got to remember that. Um, there just seems to be a spirit of prayer and worship. Yeah, this is fascinating. So wh what did they do before, <laughs> before that? Uh, look at verses 18. Um, yeah, Jehoshaphat bowed uh, with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. And then some of the Levites and some of the rest of them stepped forward, and early in the morning, verse 20, they set out, and uh, they basically worshiped before they went out. And verse 21 says, After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out and headed for the, uh, the uh, went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Psalm 136. Now you think about that. The army is amassed, and they've had this great time of prayer and a response. And they're told what to do. You're not even going to have to fight. So what do they do? What all of us should do. Worship God. And so they went out singing and praising the Lord. Well, what happens? Verses 22 through 30. You know what happens? Very simply. An ambush. But God's people didn't have to do anything. You know what happened? Three different countries coming to make war. They turned on each other. You can read the paragraph. They destroyed themselves. And God's people didn't even have to fight. In fact, they went back, which was customary, to get the plunder, all these dead soldiers, stuff that they could use. It took them three days to get all of it. And so it ends basically in verse 29. Um, the fear of God came upon all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel and the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace for his God had given him rest on every side. It's a great story, folks. And don't take just what I've told you or read about it. Go back and read it again. It is a powerful story of how we should respond in situations that we find ourselves in, just like King Jehoshaphat responded by leading God's people in a time of fasting and prayer and witnessing how God would take care of them. Charles Finney uh, is uh, an old uh, preacher revivalist you can read about him in church history uh, great uh, quote again prayer doesn't change God it changes you so that it is consistent for God to do what he wants to do anyway faith is the key and you don't need more faith use what you have faith isn't believing God can but that he will it's a great statement Oswald Chambers, you read his devotional last year. Oswald Chambers said, there is no such thing as unanswered prayer. God answers every prayer. It might not be like you requested, but God knows what is best and will answer it in a way that is best for us. So I just, again, want to challenge you with the spirit of Jehoshaphat. I want, you to, I want to challenge you with this story from our Old Testaments and how things can change when God's people pray. Now, let me just mention to you some things you might know and you might not know. There's a lot of prayer going on in this church right now. Now, I'm going to mention some efforts, but I'm sure everybody's praying, but I just want to mention some that I know about. So if I've missed something you're involved in, why don't you come up afterwards and tell me about that so I'll be enlightened. But what I know about is Don Bigner is part of leading a group at 5 p.m. every Sunday night here to pray, at which everybody's invited. And then Sherry Street, who happens to be in here, doesn't have to be in the nursery like she thought, said, again, she'll be circling the church, and many of you have circled the church and prayed about things. 
so you can do that. Diana Knight is fixing up and going to have that prayer room in the strategic time just before the election, and it was in your paper last week, and there'll be more instructions on that. There are uh, other opportunities. I think Judy Winnegar and Sherry and maybe even a group that I don't know everybody that's in it meets in the fellowship hall before church and prays for worship. I just want to commend you for what you're already doing. I'm preaching about so I guess I could say I'm preaching to the choir because you already believe what I'm trying to get you to believe. And I just hope that you will remember, whether it be shootings, race relationships, terrorism, bathroom issues, hostility against Christians, the election, the Supreme Court appointees, or any number of a thousand things, the battle is the Lord's. Now, with that, I want you to pray with the greatest intensity you've ever had. But the battle is the Lord's. This morning, we customarily uh, close the service with what we call an invitation or decision time. And so the worship team can feel free to come and we'll prepare to sing with them. And it is a chant time. If you want to make some kind of a public decision, you can do that. If you don't want to, you just stand where you are and make a decision. Because I do think every Sunday it's decision time for all of us. Hopefully coming to church has kind of pricked our conscience a little bit. And maybe there's some things that we can do for our spiritual life and following Jesus that we hadn't done last week. So it is decision time for all of us. If you have a need to talk about becoming a Christian and confessing Jesus and being baptized, we'd be glad to do that, or we would receive somebody that's already done that to be a place of membership, or if you just want to have a time of prayer. Why don't you stand? If you have any of those needs, come. If not, right where you are, uh, make uh, a decision that next week I'm going to do this or that that will help me in my spiritual walk.